the, you know, the thing I'm going to talk about today a little bit is to kick it off is uh, what we kind of call the, the cloud for modern business, which is kind of our overall strategy that we're adopting uh, around the cloud and enterprise group um, and really kind of enables, we think, a wide variety of different scenarios uh, where integration is kind of a key element of all of those um, that we do. If we could put the slides up, that'd be great. Um, and then what we're going to do is drill into more depth on the integration aspects in particular, uh, focusing around the application platform side uh, and drill in even further throughout the rest of the day. Uh, in terms of kind of one of the things you'll hear us talk about at Microsoft um, you know, quite a bit, and it's something that we've sort of been talking about really for the last 12 months, and you're going to see us continue this over the next 12 months, is the, you know, the, the fact that we're living now in what we call mobile-first, cloud-first world. Uh, and it's something that we see both as consumers, but increasingly we're going to see every modern business uh, also uh, embrace as well. And you know, many, if not most, businesses are already on that transition. And certainly within Microsoft, one of the things that we're doing is also adapting our overall product portfolio to embrace this new world. And how do we really provide compelling, uh, differentiated solutions that enable all of our customers to embrace it and be even more successful within it? Uh, within my group, which is the Cloud Enterprise group here at Microsoft, we've kind of focused on five core, what we call pillar scenarios uh, that, that we're investing in, uh, that we think kind of adapt in terms of and integrate within this world uh, and really provide, hopefully, some unique differentiation um, that lights up across it. Uh, and the kind of five core pillars here that I'm going to walk through uh, throughout this talk as kind of an overview of our overall strategy are around uh, infrastructure transformation, in particular, how do we transform the data center using public cloud? How do we enable the unlocking of insight on top of data, uh, not just data within your own databases, but increasingly data that comes from a variety of different sources that you want to be able to integrate across and be able to integrate with? Uh, how do we enable what we call enterprise mobility, uh, which is how do we enable employees to use the devices they love? as well as the applications and SaaS solutions that they love, while at the same time keeping their companies secure? Uh, how do we help create the Internet of Things and being able to pull together data uh, as well as uh, devices um, that are not just uh, phones, but increasingly embedded devices that are scattered throughout an organization uh, or throughout their customers? Uh, and then you know, the piece that we're going to spend the rest of the day talking about in more depth, which is around enabling application innovation on top of all these different changes. Uh, and one of the things I think you'll see, hopefully throughout even the demos and some of these scenarios, is the key role that integration plays across all of them. You need infrastructure in order to run solutions. You want to be able to integrate across a variety of different apps and a variety of different platforms as you do that. You want to have your data be able to integrate across a variety of different systems and a variety of different applications to get the unique insight. You want your security architecture, as well as your mobile devices to be able to integrate seamlessly across those solutions. Uh, and then you want to be able to kind of build solutions and applications and write custom code that can actually pull all these things together in unique ways and really light up for customers. Uh, and I think there's a huge opportunity for all of us, and, and really this event's about talking about it, getting your feedback, uh, and starting that conversation. So what I'm going to do here is just going to kick it off, is kind of provide an overview of all five of these pillars and some of the work we're doing. So you can kind of see a little bit of the forest for the trees. And then Bill's going to come on after me and drill specifically in the application innovation bucket and to go into much more depth around our application platform for integration going forward. First kind of pillar I'm just going to talk about, though, to give some, some context around is what we call transforming the data center and some of the big changes that we see around how customers are increasingly looking to host applications and how they're looking to take advantage of the public cloud uh, increasingly as they do that. Uh, Azure is uh, Microsoft's public cloud platform, uh, and it really provides a way that you can basically use our infrastructure uh, to be able to host and run applications all over the world. Uh, we kind of relaunched Azure, I'd say, about two and a half years ago, uh, and kind of really re-envisioned it on a couple of different dimensions. Um, you know, one is uh, that makes Azure unique is the fact that it supports both a rich infrastructure as a service platform, which allows you to run any virtual machine with any code on any operating system, uh, and provides really a super flexible base platform on which to run anything. But then it also brings together a unique set of platform as a service capabilities, uh, including integration, uh, that you can leverage as well when you run those solutions. And one of the things we think is unique about it 
Azure is the fact that you can use the best of the infrastructure as a service capabilities and the best of platform as a service capabilities together. Uh, you can use the best of the Windows ecosystem and the best of the Linux ecosystem together. And we really provide a set of tools and management capabilities uh, that we think really give you unparalleled productivity uh, and scale as you do it. We've been hard at work with Azure in terms of building out its capabilities. On average, we ship uh, a new feature now pretty much every other day. Uh, and this is just a small subset of some of the ones that we've shipped over the last 12 months. Uh, there's a bunch of capabilities on the infrastructure side. You know, we keep building out and, and adding. But one that you can kind of see here also on the, this list of features is also some of the higher level platform capabilities uh, that we're increasingly shipping, uh, including ones way up high up in the stack like machine learning, streaming analytics, uh, integration workflow, uh, EDI capabilities, and more. Uh, and again, it's that combination that we think of infrastructure plus platform in a completely open way that we think is pretty unique uh, amongst all the cloud vendors out there. And you're going to see us continue to differentiate along those lines. Uh, as we've kind of built out our functionality, we're seeing our adoption really spike on Azure. Um, we're getting more than 10,000 new customers signed up per week. Uh, we've got more than 1.2 million databases now hosted uh, inside our cloud. We've got more than 30 trillion storage objects uh, now stored inside Azure. Uh, more than 350 million uh, corporate users have now sunk their Active Directory systems to us. And we're processing more than 18 billion authentications now per week. You might think that's a heck of a lot of people logging in. Uh, and it's true, there are a lot of people log in, but increasingly in this integration world, those authentications and authorization accesses are not happening manually, but their applications and their backend systems that are using this type of, of uh, cloud directory in order to provide secure access programmatically. Uh, and and you know, that uh, drives a heck of a lot of those um, uh, authentications and authorizations. We've got more than 2 million developers now registered with Visual Studio Online, which is our online SaaS developer service. Uh, and increasingly, we're seeing people not just use this for infrastructure, but more than 60% of customers now are using some of the higher level services in the analytics space, media streaming, workflow, et cetera. Uh, and again, it's that combination that we think ends up being pretty unique. And there's some really great solutions that I'll talk about later that customers have developed and are deployed now uh, running on this stack. Now, obviously, there's lots of people in the cloud space. You know, and one of the things that people often ask me is, so how are you different than the other guys? Uh, and one of the things I often show people is this, this slide, which talks about kind of the three unique um, circles of capability that we think we bring to bear uh, with our overall cloud platform uh, that we do think is unique uh, and, and, and very different in the market. And those basically are hyperscale, enterprise, great, and hybrid. And really, the Microsoft Cloud is, is really the only cloud out there that is looking to do all three. And we think the union of all three or the intersection of all three ends up being something that uh, for business customers as well as for enterprise solutions uh, is something that people are looking for and ultimately allows them to build the best solutions that are differentiated. And I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about all three. On the hyperscale front, one of the things about hyperscale uh, that I often like to talk about is the geographic scale uh, that the cloud really starts to enable as you're looking to build solutions for your customers. Uh, and the ability to build out and deploy solutions in seconds all over the world is something that is fairly unique in the computer industry and really opens up a huge number of possibilities. Uh, the green circles here on this map uh, represent Azure regions, which are clusters of data centers where you can basically deploy and run your code. Uh, and um, we have today 19 regions uh, open for business around the world. Um, every one of these green dots, um, with the exception of the two in India, which we've announced but haven't opened yet, but the other 19 green dots are now open for business, and you can literally you know, sign up today and deploy your solution in any of these locations. This is the widest geographic distribution of any major cloud provider. Uh, from the perspective, AWS has 11 regions open for business today, uh, and Google has three. Uh, and so it's about six times the number of Google, almost twice the number of Amazon. We, allow you to basically, the other thing that we, we do, which is kind of nice, is for each of the major geopolitical entities, we try to make sure that we have two regions that are in there that are at least 600 miles apart, so that in the event of a natural disaster, an earthquake, a flood, or something that takes out an entire area, uh, you know that your solutions can run without having, having to migrate the data outside of that country or that region, um, which is something that for a whole bunch of customers is obviously top of mind. Uh, and really key from a, a data sovereignty perspective. Uh, we also provide um, 
uh, a wide range of solutions, you know, including for government and public sector. Uh, and so for people that have requirements around um, uh, security and compliance, which we'll talk about later, uh, we have some of the widest um, variety of, of standard support out there. You know, what makes each of the regions impressive is not just the sheer number of them, but also the size of them. Uh, each of our data center buildings um, for the data centers that we build are roughly about a football field in size, uh, roughly enough space to park two jumbo jets within. This is a feature we try not to take advantage of, but uh, <laughs> it's good to know that it's an option uh, if this cloud thing doesn't work out. Um, and then basically the way we build our data center regions is we typically have, you know, we have multiple of them sitting side by side. So for our, our latest generation of data centers, we design with space so that we can put 16 of these data center buildings next to each other, um, which is basically enough space to store 600,000 servers uh, in each region. And remember, we have 19 of them around the world. And you know, we think you know, this really provides unprecedented scale um, and gives you the ability that you can deploy solutions with confidence and scale them up and scale them down pretty much at will anywhere around the world. Uh, and that ability to have this type of compute pay by the minute uh, and not have any upfront costs or any termination fees really transforms how people ultimately build solutions and the types of things you can do with it. You know, one of the things that people often ask me is, okay, that's great, but I, you know, I, I don't work for a consumer startup. I'm not building the next Facebook. What could I possibly need all of that compute resources um, for? And you know, a whole bunch of customers I can talk about. I'm just gonna talk about three, because uh, I think there's some, some good customer stories about how enterprise customers are taking advantage of this enterprise scale capability. Um, one of our customers here is Milliman. Uh, it's been actually, they've been on Azure uh, almost from the beginning. Uh, and it's, I think it's a great story in the sense of it's a customer that you know, 10 years ago you wouldn't have ever thought of as a software company. Uh, they were formed, I think, in 1946. Uh, they're an actuarial life insurance um, consulting firm uh, that provide actuarial services to like, life insurance companies and other financial institutions. And what they basically have built out is increasingly moving to the model where they can provide software as a service capabilities to their enterprise customers. So that they can do richer modeling, risk analysis, as well as portfolio analysis um, to those firms. Uh, and increasingly, you can think of them actually as more and more of a software company as opposed to an actuarial company in terms of how they deliver their services and how they're driving their revenue. What's cool about it is they're able to use the cloud so that when a customer says at the end of the, you know, has a, signs up with a contract and says, every night I want you to look at my portfolio and understand how exposed am I to risk, uh, they basically use the cloud to basically take that portfolio and do billions of transactions overnight, analyzing and doing Monte Carlo simulations in terms of risk and being able to provide before the market opens to that firm. Here's how you're exposed, here's how you should best hedge, and here's, here's what you need to think about in terms of protecting uh, your, your investment in your portfolio. And what's cool about it is they're able to avoid ever having to buy a single server. Um, they're able to basically sign up an infinite amount of business because they don't, they're never constrained in terms of capacity. Uh, and for each of their individual customers now, they spin up more than fi up to 50,000 cores per night uh, doing this type of risk analysis. And they're very proud of the fact that they've never once had to turn down an emergency request from a customer who wants to basically uh, you know, look at their, their portfolio in, in an urgent way. Uh, and you know, they're able to do it anywhere around the world, meet all those data sovereignty needs, and literally spin up and spin down and pay only for the minutes of the compute that they actually need. Uh, car sales is an, kind of an, another example in a completely different geography. This is an Australian-based company that's um, uh, traded publicly. Uh, they do, I think, over 18 billion classified ads in Australia every month. Uh, or uh, impressions every month, uh, and they're expanding around the world. And they're basically uh, adopted the cloud and obviously adopted Azure in order to do it. And they're seeing some really amazing kind of results from it. You know, one of the things that they realized um, pretty quickly is they want a cloud that can go everywhere and that can scale up to handle 18 billion impressions. But the other interesting thing about it was they realized very quickly um, as they looked at their traffic uh, that, you know, they don't actually need that infrastructure to handle 18 billion impressions 24 seven throughout the day. Uh, it turns out in Australia, people don't buy cars in the morning, they buy them all in the evening. Uh, and what they found in their traffic is that their peak period is typically in the, in the early evening time frame, And their morning period is kind of a trough period where they don't actually need much capacity. And so they basically, as part of moving to the cloud, implemented an auto scaling capability. So that in the morning, their site runs on six servers. 
uh, and in the evening it runs on 98 servers. Uh, and they basically scale up and scale down based on the capacity they need. Uh, and I was with the, the CIO uh, just about four weeks ago, and he was telling a great story where he said basically by moving to the cloud, they chopped an entire zero off of their IT budget uh, in terms because they just they didn't need these servers. And that's something also as we kind of look increasingly even at enterprise scenarios, if you actually measure what does your peak to trough period look like, um, you know most organizations can save and cut their infrastructure often by half or more. Uh, as you actually look at what is the real utilization of your servers actually running at. Uh, and we think, you know, again, this type of dynamic hyperscale capability ends up being a big game changer uh, for people that are looking to actually save money, um, you know, or in the case of Milliman, obviously, take advantage of new scenarios. And this last customer I was talking about in the hyperscale um, side is a company called Takenaka, uh, which is based in Japan. Uh, and um, they're uh, one of the, the largest building contractor firms in uh, Japan. And so a lot of the high-rise buildings inside Tokyo, uh, they manage uh, all the facilities, you know, all the, the taking care of the infrastructure, air conditioning, security, et cetera. And one of the things that they've um, uh, done historically is they will often have a building staff that stays with the building for the entire lifetime, pretty much, of the building. And so some of their staff have been there 20, 30, 40 years. What they're finding is that staff is increasingly retiring, and because the overall workforce is actually shrinking, it's often hard to replace them. And a lot of institutional knowledge ends up being lost when those people retire. Uh, and so the knowledge that, hey, when it's really hot in Tokyo at 8 a.m., you want to turn up the air conditioning two extra points on the 21st floor. In the past, was all human knowledge. And again, that human knowledge is hard to preserve. And you know, when it retires, it, it retires with it. One of the things that they're doing is they're embracing Internet of Things, uh, and they basically have plumbed all of their buildings with IoT sensors so they can actually now capture data. They're basically streaming it through Azure. They're doing machine learning and advanced heuristics on top of it. And now, whether or not the air conditioning goes up or down is not based on institutional knowledge. It's not even based on rules programmed into the system. They're able to actually use machine learning heuristics to automatically vary the temperature. Uh, using what the ML system has seen based on real training data. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting example also of how can you use the cloud, how can you use this type of capability uh, to process and store vast amounts of data, be able to reason over it, and build net new solutions that really power the enterprise going forward. So we think hyperscale is, is kind of one of the key things that, that, that we bring to the table. You know, there are other people that provide hyperscale. You know, obviously, you know, we ultimately think there's probably only three that will ultimately be hyperscale cloud providers in the cloud space. Uh, we think it's us, Google, and Amazon. Um, you know, we don't see a lot of the other traditional vendors reaching this type of, of uh, scale where you have the geographic reach and that elasticity ability to scale up and scale down. Uh, many of the other traditional uh, enterprise vendors are taking much more of a managed hosting approach instead. Uh, and we don't think, when you look at those three examples I just walked through of Milliman, Car Sales, and Takanaka, even though they're widely different, you know, a managed hosting world would not fit well with their business models, nor with what we think are uh, a lot of the new business models that enterprises need going forward. So we think we differentiate on that. How do we differentiate versus the others in the hyperscale category? That's with the other two circles here, which is enterprise grade and hybrid, uh, which are areas that we're pushing really hard on uh, and we're looking to lead on from our cloud offering. You know, Gartner uh, each year publishes their uh, cloud magic quadrant surveys. They have four uh, cloud surveys that they publish, one on infrastructure, one on applications, one on storage, one on virtualization. Uh, Microsoft right now is the only leader in all four magic quadrants. Uh, Amazon's in two of them, Google's in none of them. Uh, and, you know, this is something we've kind of invested heavily in in terms of the capabilities to really be enterprise grade and to provide the type of enterprise promises that customers expect. Uh, from a compliance perspective, uh, we've also invested very heavily in making sure that we have world-class compliance and certifications, whether it's ISO, whether it's SOC, whether it's PCI DSS so that you can do commercial transactions and commerce, uh, whether it's HIPAA so you can do healthcare, uh, whether it's government certifications like IRAP for Australia, G2 for the UK, um, FedRAMP for the US, EU model clauses for other parts of Europe, and a lot more. Uh, this is something that we're really focusing on and making sure that you can really trust our cloud to run your business and that you're never prevented from entering any market or targeting any customer when you do so. We've also spent a lot of time, you'll see us kind of even in the next three weeks, 
get dramatically better in terms of the performance guarantees that we're able to offer customers when they run their solutions. Uh, in September, we, we rolled out our uh, new D series of virtual machine offerings. Uh, these are super powerful VMs, 60% uh, faster, more memory, and importantly, all of them have local SSD drives that you can take advantage of. Uh, last month, we announced our new G family series of virtual machines. Uh, these are the largest VMs uh, in the cloud space. Uh, the G stands for Godzilla, um, uh, which amazingly our marketing team allowed us to use. Uh, I was assuming I was going to have to replace that at the end, and they said, oh, keep it in, it's cute. Um, but these are really monsters of machines. They're optimized for data workloads. Uh, they support up to 32 of the late, uh, CPU cores, and this is the latest Intel uh, Haswell processors and the servers, uh, the first of any of the cloud vendors to the ship. Uh, we support up to half a terabyte of RAM and almost seven terabytes of local SSD. Uh, put this in perspective, that's two times the amount of memory of the largest AWS instance. That's four times the amount of memory of the largest Google instance. And this really lets you run the largest types of workloads out there and, um, and really be able to, to take advantage of it. What's cool about the cloud is not only can you do this, but it's not a case where you need to request a support ticket it's not a procurement where you need to actually wait days or weeks in order to get it approved. You can literally go up to a portal, click, click, and have this deployed in under five minutes and start using it. You pay only by the minute, and when you turn it off, the payment stops. And that ability to spin up and spin down really elastically anywhere around the world and pay by the minute really changes how you think even about procurement, how you think about solutions, and in terms of measuring ROI for customers really is a game changer in terms of, I think, for enterprise um, capabilities. In addition to uh, providing large VMs, the other thing we're about to launch um, this month is our new Azure Premium Storage offering. Uh, this works with both that D series and G series of hardware, uh, and it basically provides the fastest um, uh, storage architecture of any of the major public cloud providers. Uh, we support up to 32 terabytes of storage per virtual machine now that you can mount. It's this durable, guaranteed, triple replicated storage on each right. Uh, it supports more than 50,000 IOPS per VM, uh, and it supports less than one millisecond read latency. Uh, and so now you can basically, again, spin this up, attach it, and literally in two or three minutes have a virtual machine up and running of any size anywhere in the world and be able to run the most intensive demanding workloads on top of it. You know, these are a couple of customers um, on, the, uh, on the enterprise grade kind of capability that are already betting on this type of technology today. Uh, GE Healthcare in the healthcare space is using Azure uh, to store, you know, uh, to work better with hospitals, to do better patient care, uh, as well as to kind of manage instruments even better. Uh, Datastack is a company um, that is uh, a great startup that's pro providing Cassandra-based services to, to enterprise customers. Uh, they're working with First American Financial. Um, that does uh, titles uh, for mortgages and property here in the U.S. Um, they're actually putting together a solution with them where they can store more than 18 billion title documents um, for every address and every property in the entire United States and basically providing really innovative service that allows customers to look up you know, what happened in their house 40 years ago uh, and actually see all the title information and title ownership kind of capabilities and be able to do that at split-second speeds. Uh, and BDO is one of the largest uh, financial auditors and financial firms in Australia. And they're basically providing full financial services to all their customers. Uh, and you know, one of the things that, that the reason they bet on Azure is the fact that we now have these two Azure regions open in Australia. Uh, and they can basically promise their customer, your data never leaves Australia. Uh, and it's safe with Microsoft. And they said that pretty, makes, pretty much makes all of their customers feel uh, comfortable that it's cloud-based. Um, and find to use. The other thing that we're sort of different on is the fact that we really believe in hybrid, and we're really looking to enable hybrid solutions that can span across cloud and on-premises. And right now, we're the only cloud provider that actually lets you run software uh, that we build in an on-premise facility. Uh, and that ability to kind of bridge existing data centers, existing service provider environments with the cloud, uh, we think is something that pretty much every enterprise needs and once going forward. Uh, we provide a really easy way now that you can pretty much connect any server and any data center out there to the cloud, um, whether it's with storage, whether it's for backup, whether it's for disaster recovery, whether it's identity management, networking, or more. Um, we provide kind of a rich set of solutions that you can take advantage of in order to do so. 
Um, earlier this year, we kind of completed an acquisition of a company called Inmaj uh, that provides disaster recovery capabilities. Uh, it allows you to do it not only with Hyper-V, but it also works with VMware, it works with bare metal servers, whether it's Linux or Windows, uh, and allows you to have a complete end-to-end -end DR stack for your solutions. Our tiered storage solutions with things like Store Simple um, allow you to provide local hybrid storage. So in other words, a device that you put in your on-premises facility, uh, it allows you know, basically hyper-fast storage access that can then spill over to the cloud and take advantage of the cloud as well if you actually uh, want to do deep archiving of storage or other types of capabilities as well. A lot of solutions you can take advantage of. Beyond just connecting on-premise facilities to the cloud, the other thing that we're focusing on is how do we provide a consistent architecture that allows you to implement solutions that can run in the cloud or just run on-prem. It doesn't require you to go to the cloud unless you want to. Uh, and one of the things that we launched, um, uh, and it's now available for purchase, is something we call the Cloud Platform System, uh, which allows you to basically have an integrated software and hardware stack that provides the full Azure management portal experience, as well as our core Azure services uh, that runs inside your cloud, can run completely disconnected, uh, doesn't require any touch from us, uh, and it allows you know, any enterprise uh, even the most conservative enterprises, and we have defense contractors as well as heavily regulated banks already taking advantage of this capability um, to basically run the, uh, a cloud-based architecture inside their data centers and know that they have the resilience as well as the capability in the future to go to public cloud if they want to um, or stay entirely private cloud um, going forward. So that's a little bit in terms of kind of the overall from an infrastructure perspective. We think these three capabilities, inter hyperscale, enterprise, grade hybrid, are fairly unique when combined. Uh, and we really think meet the needs of pretty much uh, every enterprise environment and kind of provide a unique way uh, for any business to basically power their systems going forward. Um, beyond just providing the infrastructure, though, obviously, is how do we connect ISVs and partners, uh, including a lot of the people in this room, uh, with enterprises? and really provide an ecosystem and an overall market uh, that can enable everyone to be successful. Uh, and one of the things that, that, that we've um, uh, been working to do with Azure, and we launched uh, just about four weeks ago, is something we call the Azure Marketplace. Uh, and this provides a really easy way for any of our partners or any ISVs to basically deliver solutions that anyone that signs up to Azure can take advantage of, uh, and provides a really nice way to kind of accelerate time to market and provide you know, a really fast way in order for anyone to actually deploy and be successful. Um, um, but with the marketplace, we're also making it really easy for you to find solutions that allow you to deploy anywhere around the world without having to do uh, a lot of that heavy lifting and a lot of that wiring up, and instead allows you to focus much more on delivering business value to your customers. Right. Uh, we then, on top of that, have a whole bunch of other solutions, which I'm going to kind of walk through in terms of kind of our overall portfolio which provide those higher level capabilities which avoid you having to do as much plumbing uh, at the lower level and provide even more opportunities to integrate more solutions together uh, and be able to kind of light up even more uh, differentiated solutions uh, that integrate with your customers. So we'll just walk through a couple of these. The, the, the next one we'll walk through is kind of what I call enterprise mobility. Uh, and basically our goal with here is at a high level which is how do we enable employees to use the devices they love while keeping their company secure. Uh, and um, you know, increasingly, we're seeing people that want to use their own devices that they bring to work, or they want to use devices uh, that, you know, that, that they want to use, uh, that, that you know, the company provides an option for them to pick from multiple. And you know, they say, hey, I, I don't want to use an old BlackBerry. I want to use a modern phone, uh, as an example. Or I want to use a specific laptop or a specific device. How do we enable that while at the same time enabling companies to stay secure? Um, and the same way that people are increasingly doing that, not only for devices, but they're also increasingly bringing their own SaaS apps to work, or at the business unit level, adopting SaaS solutions uh, that they want to use to be successful. Uh, and again, how does IT not get in the way, but really enable this and make their employees more successful uh, and make IT, frankly, more loved as they do it? One of the things that we've kind of built out um, that we think is kind of compelling is this thing we call the Enterprise Mobility Suite that we launched about seven months ago, and we're seeing some really great success with. And one of the things it does is it basically provides a whole bunch of sub solutions that enable employees uh, to be much more um, uh, mobile and much more successful in terms of doing it. It provides full device management support, 
uh, it provides identity management capabilities, um, including the ability to log in to almost 2,500 different SaaS applications out there and integrate across them uh, in a completely secure way. Uh, it supports um, uh, rights management, so you can actually encrypt data and store it securely. And it also supports the ability for you to stand up client applications that run in our cloud that you can then stream to any mobile device. And what's great is it pretty much works on any device and across any type of application, which makes it really easy to integrate inside any enterprise. Uh, on the device management front, the built-in support we provide is part of the system called Intune. Uh, and it provides the standard device management that you'd expect, and there's other vendors out there uh, that provide it as well. What makes this kind of unique with our device management and our EMS offering is something we call conditional access, which you can turn on both if you have an on-premise exchange server or if you have an Office 365 server in the cloud. And basically what conditional access does is it makes it really easy for you as IT to actually enable and enroll your devices without you having to manually touch everyone's phone to do it. And so as a simple example, let's say you have an iOS device uh, and you're using the standard built-in iOS mail client. You turn on conditional access and an employee goes and syncs to your Exchange server, either on-prem or in the cloud. Rather than get their email, we provide a really nice, friendly inbox with one message that says, hey, there's one more thing you need to do. Please just go ahead and click this button. Uh, once you do that, it will install the Intune app out of the App Store, the iOS standard App Store, at which point the device is enrolled. And IT can then basically make sure that there's standard policies applied to it around security and around conditional access. They can roll out VPN solutions to that device now uh, automatically. So if, the, if you want to enable tunneling or other types of uh, device mobility. And you can also now roll out applications that are pre-installed within that uh, device as well. What's cool from an integration perspective is it's not just about device management, but the EMS suite also supports now more than 2,000 plus SaaS solutions out there that you can also integrate with from an identity perspective and enable both single sign-on, OAuth, SAML integration, uh, as well as richer integration scenarios uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later um, from an application development perspective as well. Uh, how many people here are, have a company that either integrates with SaaS or uses SaaS? or is building a solution for a partner where they want to be able to integrate with SaaS. Okay. number of people are. Um, we basically make it really easy. Um, you go into Azure, into the Azure management portal. If you want to integrate, say, with uh, Salesforce and have your uh, employees use their corporate Active Directory accounts instead of a separate Salesforce account to do it, you basically just say, let's connect with Salesforce. We have 2,000 plus adapters pre-written. You then enter in your Salesforce uh, key. Uh, this is an IT admin step. And then once you do these three simple steps, any of your employees can now log in going to salesforce.com using their corporate username password. And now instead of having a separate identity system that Salesforce managed, it's now going through the same identity system that the enterprise is using for all the other systems as well. The benefit about that is if the employee ever leaves the organization, their access to their Salesforce account gets disabled because it's owned by the company, not by the individual employee. Um, and this gives you kind of an easy way that companies can now adopt SaaS. They can now integrate with more solutions while keeping the company entirely secure. A couple other cool features that we provide as part of this include the ability to actually identify what SaaS solutions an enterprise is actually using. A number of people didn't raise their hand and said, hey, we don't use SaaS today. Uh, a lot of CIOs will often say they don't use SaaS today. Uh, one of the tools that we've kind of shipped, which is kind of eye-opening, is the ability to either download your network logs, uh, your firewall logs, and actually look to see what SaaS apps your employees are using, uh, or you can turn on a capability inside System Center uh, client uh, management tools to actually identify it as well. In general, what we find is uh, for every um, SaaS app that the CIO thinks that their organization is using, on average, their organization is using 12 times more. Uh, and so if they think they're using one, it turns out when they audit it, they're usually using 12. Uh, if they think they're using 10, they're usually using closer to 120. Uh, and that's because more and more business units are kind of adopting SaaS, they're adopting solutions, and they're not bothering to tell IT. Uh, and there's no easy way to kind of enforce that type of uh, security and that type of um, su uh, support. This makes it really easy that you can both identify those cases, and without shutting them off, you can instead integrate uh, a single sign-on solution that works with your existing security model uh, and makes you secure. 
What's cool about this is, of course, once you do that, you then open up a whole bunch more integration capabilities. Because you can now not only simply enable it from a security perspective, but you can actually access that data, you can analyze that data, and you can start to stitch together these different systems into compelling solutions with custom code that integrates not only with SaaS, but also with your on-premise facilities. And that's something we're going to talk more about as part of our application platform in terms of some of the tools that we're doing to enable that. Uh, but identity integration is kind of one of the key elements that facilitates and makes that possible. Other cool thing we're doing from a security perspective on the integration front is providing machine learning heuristics built into the system so that we can look for suspicious activity. How many people have ever been fished or have been, had their company undertaken a phishing attack? No. Either everyone's very bold or everyone is very private about their security or everyone is very tired. Um, but you know, in general, we see phishing attacks as probably one of the most common ways that people are attacking uh, organizations out there. Uh, pretty much every organization on the planet has been phished. Uh, so if you, ha if you don't know that you've been phished, guess what? You probably have been and you just don't know it. Um, and you know, one of the things that I think from an integration challenge perspective that people are struggling with is how do I adopt SaaS? How do I adopt mobile devices? How do I enable this sort of mobility of applications as well as experiences, but keep things secure? And so one of the things that we've done um, uh, within our Azure Active Directory system, which enables the sign-on with SaaS, is built in this machine learning heuristics where we can actually look at your user login behavior and actually identify whether or not someone has had their, comp their, their credentials compromised or the device compromised. And so if we see, for example, you logged in here in Redmond, to a particular application, and then an hour later, you logged in Romania or Thailand into another application. Uh, that is usually a sign of either telepathic capability or possibly that your credentials have been stolen. Uh, and our system will automatically detect it, notify IT, and you can set up policies to enforce things like two-factor authentication as a way to kind of basically ensure that um, you prevent that and you can basically monitor it. Uh, we also just announced two weeks ago uh, an acquisition of another security company that will be rolling into AD on-prem, which does the same thing here for all your internal Active Directory resources. And the ability now to look at any of the apps that you run on-premises, as well as any of the SaaS apps that you integrate with the cloud, and look for abnormal behavior amongst your users, you know, ends up making everything much more secure, and again, opens up a lot more integration capabilities um, for you to customize and provide custom integration solutions. The other thing that we're uh, about to launch um, this month is our new remote app service, which has been in preview. We'll go GA very shortly. Uh, it basically allows you to host any type of client application or any type of application for that matter in the cloud and also provide a way that you can enable mobile users to access it. How many people here have a Windows client application inside their organization? Great. Uh, my guess is probably a few more of you do too as well, but uh, um, yeah, one of the things that people often ask is how do I enable that for people that now are using iPads or Android devices? How do I enable that so people can access that application at home in addition to work? Uh, and how, do I, how can I do that in a secure way without having to open up my firewall? Uh, and one of the things we do with this remote app service is we allow you now to host Windows client applications inside Azure. Uh, you can optionally connect those client applications back to your network in a secure fashion. And now instead of opening your network up to thousands of users, you're opening it up just to our cloud. And then you can basically stream those applications to any device. Uh, and basically anyone with any device, doesn't even have to be uh, MDM managed, can basically open the app. They can browse all the apps that their IT department or you have decided to expose to them. So that custom expense report app, that custom approval app, that custom sales management app can now all be managed or can all be exposed. You click and then you basically are remoted into it and managed it again on any device anywhere around the world. Uh, and so this provides again another way that you can kind of start to open up and enable this enterprise mobility even of existing legacy assets of code bases that might be 20 or 30 years old. You can now actually host in the cloud and stream to any device and again open up a whole bunch more capabilities. So that's a little bit in terms of kind of this enterprise mobility uh, pillar. Uh, and again, we think having that kind of security model, having that uh, device model, having that access model that lets you connect to and use any app on any device anywhere around the world, you know, is another core enabler uh, of not only enterprises, but a building block upon which we can build integration solutions on top of. 
kind of quickly going through the rest of the pillars, uh, talk about unlocking insight on any data. Um, you know, increasingly we're seeing people that, that want to be able to get insight on top of data. They don't just want to store data for operational purposes, but they increasingly want to be able to also get insight on top of it. And we've obviously focused very heavily in the past with SQL Server in terms of having a great operational relational store. One of the things that we've done over the last 12 months, and you'll see us continue to evolve over the next six months, is also build out our data assets to be not just about operational data storage, but also building up our analytics stack even further, supporting not just relational data, but also um, NoSQL-based data, as well as Hadoop-based unstructured data, uh, and providing a rich set of data services that you can use to basically analyze and uh, perform analytics, machine learning, and other types of services on top of it. Uh, we launched recently our data factory service, which enables rich integration of data, where you can actually orchestrate data movements between systems programmatically uh, or automatically and monitor how that data is moving. We launched our new stream analytics service last month that allows you to actually look at incoming feeds of data in real time and be able to provide real time analytics and other types of um, analysis on top of it. Uh, and we've also launched our machine learning service earlier this year that allows you to take any data, whether it's in Hadoop, whether it's in Oracle, whether it's in SQL, whether it's in any type of data store, and be able to look for um, uh, anomalies, be able to look for predictions based on top of that data, and get deep insights off of it. Uh, and we think a lot of these things are provide really the low-level building blocks upon which higher-level integration solutions can be delivered, uh, and really provide uh, an awful lot of powerful tools that you can take advantage of as you do that. One of the services you're going to see us launch very shortly uh, is a new, uh, we call Power BI um, service. Uh, this basically allows you to um, do a couple things, which is not only process data, but also be able to go ahead and um, uh, plug in this little speaker here. Um, also be able to actually get visualization analysis on top of it, uh, so you can actually um, uh, analyze and understand that data at a deeper level as well. I'm going to play a little video that hopefully will show off this experience a little bit, and then I'll do a demo of it as well. Um, one of the things we're trying to enable with this Power BI solution is the ability for you to basically, you know, literally in minutes, be able to stand up and provide a rich visualization capability for any solution that you want to roll out to. Uh, so it allows Let me show just a quick video of this in action uh, to give you kind of a sense of what this looks like from a SaaS perspective. Sure. There we go. So this is basically, we have a dashboard view that you can basically um, take advantage of. You can very easily stand up a dashboard on top of any data. You can see here, you can integrate with any SaaS app. So if I want to connect with Salesforce, just type in your Salesforce credentials. We do an OAuth handshake against it. And then basically, we can import and suck in any of your Salesforce data, provide a rich visualization dashboard on top of it. We support the ability to take any of those data sources and provide natural language query against it. So this is live Salesforce data that you can basically uh, you know, sort and filter on for any of your users. You can basically drill into and analyze why is August sales down. Uh, you can sort it by industry and see, hey, the problem's in the utility sector. Uh, you can filter across all of it. And if you want to, you can then pin any of this data to your operational dashboard so that you can actually see real-time updates across it. This works in a browser. We also have mobile device apps uh, you can take advantage of. We support push notifications so that you can actually set up alerts so if any of the data ever changes. Uh, and the beauty is it lets you stand up very, very quickly, work with any type of data backend. And any of those data sources, not only do we provide out of the box, but you can now build those types of data sources as well and expose them for your users to have that type of rich BI solution on top of uh, in addition. You know, this is sort of an example of a dashboard. Uh, this is sort of the default sample dashboard that we provide with the product. Uh, just to kind of prove that the video is not smoke and mirrors and kind of try to illustrate some of the power of it. If I wanted to connect to Salesforce, I can literally go ahead and say, let's connect. I have a bunch of adapters here. Let me just sort of connect to Salesforce data. Again, I can do kind of a um, log in to Salesforce either using Salesforce credential or if I had sunk my Active Directory to it, I would just log in using my corporate credentials. Huh. That's great. And so if I can find my phone, 
they have apparently emailed me a login, which they did not do last night. Uh, uh, let me quickly find my phone. The great thing about security in this modern world is sometimes in demos, they suspect that if you do the same thing eight times that you must actually be a hacker, which in my day job I really appreciate, in my demo job I hate. Um, but here's the good news, the code, just so that everyone can see it on the big screen. Uh, <laughs> just proving it's real. Look at that. Uh, you can see basically now that I've uh, uh, convinced Salesforce that I am actually real, uh, it's basically saying, okay, you're connecting to your Salesforce account. Are you a manager? Are you a sales rep? And so you can basically choose it. Uh, and I'm going to say I'm a sales manager. Uh, and basically what this is now doing, you can see this in the top right, is importing data from Salesforce using my Salesforce account. If I click on this tab, you can see basically this is the one-time loading uh, as it's actually uh, populating and pulling in this data. It's created a custom dashboard uh, optimized for a Salesforce experience. And now I have a full BI solution on top of my actual Salesforce account, uh, all dynamically populated, even with the security code in between. And for any of these things, I can now actually drill into individual reports. I can actually go ahead and edit those reports in a full customized experience all in the browser. Uh, and basically create a kind of completely custom experience um, that anyone can use. And one of the things you'll notice here is it's pretty wickedly fast. Um, it works with any type of data. You can integrate it with any of your back-end systems that you already have. And it supports tunneling back to an on-premise basic uh, data environment so that it's not just SaaS-based, but it also works with any of the existing custom solutions you have as well. Uh, and going back to kind of from a pillar perspective, this ability, again, handle identity, handle device management, handle data insight and analytics and reporting, and again, be able to do it so that you're integrating across all these different types of solutions, you know, we think is kind of powerful and is, is sort of a core pillar of our integration uh, capabilities going forward. The creative the Internet of Things, you know, again, we think integration is not just about software solutions. It's not just about traditional PCs and devices, but it's also going to be increasingly about taking advantage of this data that exists everywhere being able to stream it, being able to process it, and be able to get rich insight on top of it. And we think there's a huge opportunity as you take you know, this device explosion that's going to happen, um, where there's literally going to be trillions of devices out there in the world. Uh, how do you actually you know, process this data, which is just going to be exponentially large in terms of the inflow of it? Uh, you know, there's a lot of data in the world today. Uh, there's actually a 41% annual compounded increase in that data going on right now. Uh, which is mind-blowing in terms of the amount of data that will be out there. You're going to need a hyperscale cloud in order to store it. You're going to need a hyperscale cloud in order to process it. And a lot of those data capabilities I just walked through in terms of unlocking insight from data, you're going to want to be able to have that capability in order to provide that type of reasoning and be able to get those types of insights on top of it. And so we're providing as part of our solution and with Azure a full solution that lets you not only store the data, not only process the data, but be able to get that insights and be able to manage that data as well. Which brings us to kind of our last pillar, and the one that we're going to spend the rest of the day going really deep on, which is enabling application innovation. And the ability not only to take advantage of a lot of these building block services that we've built, but really provide the ability that you can actually go much further and build your own custom solutions, your own custom logic that actually integrates across all of these and really enables truly differentiated uh, solutions um, that you know, are custom to whatever environment that you want to target and that really deliver the most value. Uh, we provide a bunch of building blocks that you know, I've talked about already today with Azure. Uh, we've got, with Visual Studio, uh, a super rich development tool environment. With .NET, we obviously have a really rich uh, language environment. Uh, but we're also supporting other uh, languages and environments as well uh, with Azure and with our products, um, whether it's Java, whether it's Ruby, whether it's Node, whether it's Python, whether it's PHP. You know, we have SDKs for all of those, and we, we are looking to make sure that not only is Visual Studio and .NET best in class, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we're, we provide the full breadth of support so that we can integrate and use anything. Uh, and then with our Office 365 suite, we are looking to also provide a rich set of applications and APIs that we think will also be incredibly important for uh, integration going forward. 
so that, for example, you could build a solution that takes IoT data, that takes calendar data, that takes data out of Salesforce or Dynamics, that takes data out of your on-premise system, and you can actually mash all of that together and provide kind of automated workflows as well as automated solutions that span them.